Our first speaker today uh, comes to us from our Boston campus. Song Hyun Park was born in Seoul, Korea, grew up in Paraguay, studied in Israel, served as a missionary among the Palestinians in the West Bank, and currently serves as the dean of the Boston campus at Gordon-Conwell, where he also teaches Old Testament and biblical archaeology. Song teaches and preaches in Korean, Spanish, modern Hebrew, and English. He holds a BA from the Institute of Archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Israel, an MA from the Department of Archaeology and Near Eastern Cultures at Tel Aviv University, Israel, and the PhD from the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University. And before joining Gordon Conwell, Song taught at Bethlehem Bible College in Palestine, Seminario Tirano in Argentina, and served as the interim director of Harvard University's archaeological lab in Ashkelon, Israel. He's the co-editor uh, with Bill and Aida Spencer, a volume entitled Reaching for the New Jerusalem, a Biblical and Theological Framework for the City. This morning, uh, Dr. Park will be speaking under the title, The Word of God in Psalm 119. So please, let's welcome Dr. Son Hume Park. Good morning. I will be taking my glasses on and off since I've uh, lost my bifocals somewhere and uh, this would be absolute uh, necessity this morning. Well, there are many reasons why we would want to study Psalm 119. For today, I have three. First, it is such an intriguing chapter in the Bible, a poem that runs for 176 bicola uh, lines, that just the reading of it would take up 19 of the 20 minutes allotted to me to speak this morning. <laughs> It is composed as an ultimate alphabetic acrostic where each eight lines start with the same letter of the Hebrew alphabet following the order of the Hebrew abecedary. And what came out of these alphabets is a wisdom psalm that contains individual lament addressed as a prayer. Second reason we would want to study Psalm 119 this morning is because Psalm 119 is the psalm of the Word of God, a Torah psalm, namely, and the most expansive one at that. But the importance of it lies not only in the length of the psalm, but also in the fact that it uses eight distinct terms to refer to the Word of God, which I shall return to shortly. The third and final reason we would want to study Psalm 119 today is because this is the biblical text which Martin Luther says he has learned from on how to study the Word of God. In the end, what I would like to know is what was the last and lasting impact that the Old Testament was making in the life of its reader. And I believe we can have a glimpse into that by studying Psalm 119. Now, a psalm with eight key terms for the Word of God. In fact, this is not the first time that such an idea had been entertained. Psalm 19, another well-known Torah psalm, had employed five key terms to refer to the Word of God with such an outstanding result that caused C.S. Lewis later to praise it as the greatest poem in the Psalter. 
Now consider Psalmist number 119, who is setting out to write the king of all Psalms that will outdo Psalm 19. What's the plan? Well, start with making it 13 times longer. <laughs> Throw in three more key terms for the word of God and complete the perfect number eight. And remember, in this psalm, the perfect number happens to be eight, not seven, not three. And to top it all, make it an acrostic. But acrostic of not one, not five, but eight times the abecedary. The verdict, quote, Artificial production, said someone. Quote, the most uniform and thought deprived of all sayings collections, said a second. And the most contentless product that ever blackened the paper, said the third. In order to fully appreciate the significance of the eight key terms by which Psalm 119 calls the word of God, we need to track back to Psalm 1, which has us to encounter the first of the eight key terms, Torah, for the first time in the Psalms. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the Torah of the Lord. And on his Torah, he meditates day and night. Psalm 1 being the chapter that opens the third portion of the tripartite Hebrew canon of the Old Testament, namely the writings section. The placement of the term Torah in Psalm 1 has essentially the effect of guiding the Hebrew readers to approach the entire third section of the Old Testament in the spirit of Torah. Such an introduction is also given at the start of the second of the tripartite sections of the Hebrew canon, namely the prophets. There the opening chapter is Joshua 1, in which God charges Joshua by saying, only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the Torah that Moses, my servant, commanded you. This book of Torah shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. As Wenham has aptly noted, quote, this way, the second and third parts of the Old Testament canon both point back to the Torah, namely the law, the first part of the canon, as foundational for a righteous and successful life." End quote. Torah is then the primordial concept that runs through the entirety of the Hebrew canon, and it is this stream that we encounter reaching Psalm 119 when it opens with the beatitude, blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the Torah of the Lord. As noted earlier, the journey of the Torah to Psalm 119 within the book of Psalms starts in Psalm 1, where we already encountered the first key term for the word of God, Torah. Then it comes to Psalm 19 where four additional key terms are picked up. 
that will again refer to the word of God. The first is mitzvah, commandment, mishpat, judgment, edut, stipulation, pikud, regulation. By the way, these translations are just rough equivalents, not exact. By the time the journey ends in Psalm 119, three more key terms have been added, completing the list of eight key terms by which to refer to the word of God. Imra, saying, Davar, word, Chok, statute. Now, one aspect about the scholarship on these eight key terms that is commonly accommodated is that these key terms are synonymous in use and interchangeable in meaning. Why? They just happen to complete the number eight symbolic number and we will look at other reasons later on why scholars would regard these numbers or these key the, the number eight as not necessarily functional or factual in meaning and therefore the words picked up to be part of eight uh, not to be of a uh, factual theological reflection over the time either. My contention is that that ought not to be so. When we actually analyze how these eight key terms are referred to or used in the text, in other words, what are the predicates that accompany these eight key words within the text. The picture we get is that they do seem to have unique predicates associated for each one of them. And uh, let's see. So these are the eight key terms that together are referring to uh, the concept of word of God. Oh, my slides are too vague, but what you can discern is there is the word, uh, there, there is the circle pointing to God, from him coming uh, the word that is referred to as pikud, and how in the text Pikud relates to the reader, the person, the psalmist. Interestingly, the psalmist engages with Pikud through his heart and his mouth. Comes Chok, oh, and Hebrew characters are not uh, showing correctly either. Comes chok, normally translated as statute. The reader responds through both heart and mouth once again. But interestingly, most of the times within the psalm when the psalmist is asking God to teach him, he's asking for chok. Lord, teach me your chok. comes Imra. Now, the psalmist is responding to Imra, usually translated saying, through three sensory parts of his body, heart, mouth, but interestingly, his eyes. Comes Edut, or stipulations, comes Torah, we already know that, and you know how 
the span of his response to the word is now extending to his feet. He is responding to Torah with his feet. Comes davar, same way it means word usually. Mishpat, mitzvah, for the sake of time, I'm just rushing through this. Each of these words are used at least 19 times in the psalm, or in the case of Torah, 25 times. So the frequency of their usage within the psalm is roughly equivalent, which is a, an excellent closed corpus to study with. When you match each of these words as pair and see which of the predicates are associated with these words, it turns out that between Torah and Imra, for instance, of the 15 predicates associated with Torah and the 19 predicates associated with Imra, only three are in common between the two. Meaning that each of these words carry their own uh, uh, group of predicates to go with. That ought to point to the conclusion that even though we may not be able to discern what the precise translation value in today's terms may be, in the mind of the author of this text, those eight keywords were words that each carried specific semantic meaning with it. We ought not to regard at these words as simply satisfying the symbolic convention of the time then. Now with that question settled, let me move on to touch on some aspects about the acrostic nature of the psalm. While neither Psalm 1 nor Psalm 19 are acrostic in nature, there is a value in understanding that the seed is present in Psalm 1 that will later blossom in Psalm 119. The very first word of Psalm 1, Asherah, begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, while the last word of Psalm 1, Toved, ends with the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the list of the key, eight key terms for the word of God in Psalm 119 span uh, the full gamut of the Hebrew alphabet again. And I'm going to intentionally make the next segment a uh, 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 little complex and a uh, little uh, confounding uh, uh, for the sake of demonstrating something. Now, the discussion of the acrostics goes further because one important way in which Psalm 119 may structurally be connected with the rest of the book of Psalms is in its relationship with seven other acrostic Psalms found in the book of Psalms. This structural relationship between Psalm 119 and the other seven was studied by a scholar by the name Friedman and it's far too complex to present the study itself here. But it comes down to this basic idea. There is a group of seven acrostic psalms in one side. On the other side, there is Psalm 119. If you add the seven psalms on this group together into one single text, you will end up having a psalm that is roughly equivalent to 119 
in terms of the number of the lines per strophe, which is eight in both, the number of cola in the strophe in both, 16 and 16, the total number of lines, which is 174 on the one and 176 on the second, and the total number of the cola, which is 364 uh, on the one, and then also 364 on the other. Is this a coincidence? Well, what this is suggesting is that there is the possibility that Psalm 119 was composed with the seven other acrostic psalms in full view, which would make Psalm 119 as the latest in date of all the acrostic psalms. In Friedman's own words, at a minimum, quote, we can say that this group of eight psalms is more than a haphazard or accidental collection based only on the common use of the alphabet as an organizing principle. The great psalm revolving around the number eight is celebration of the Torah, while the seven lesser psalms celebrate the whole gamut of divine activity and presence in his universe, end quote. At this point, some of you may be recalling the verdict I shared earlier. Artificial production. I say, call it intentional. Because what the preceding discussion has shown is that with Psalm 119, we may be gaining an access to the mastermind that has arranged the Psalter together, in whose design the Word of God forms the stream that channels into the Psalter, growing and expanding to form a grand reservoir in Psalm 119. And this has to do with the dating of the Psalm. In order to be able to claim that, this is the access to the mastermind that arranges the Book of Psalms together, you ought to be able to say that this is the, one of the latest psalms to be composed in date. Two thousand and ten, Armin Lange has published a study where he has convincingly, convincingly uh, uh, argued that. There are pre maccabean texts from Qumran that depend textually on this psalm, which would place the date earlier than the Hellenistic period, but that the way the psalm makes reference to the coinage would require placing the dating of the psalm after the introduction of Jewish coinage in Jerusalem, which is the fifth century. Therefore, the logic tells that the Psalms date would probably be somewhere in the mid fourth century BC. If so, by that time, Ezra's Pentateuch would have already been promulgated and the book of Psalm itself would be going through the final stages of production. There is the feasibility then that Psalm 119 would be capturing the thoughts and conditions of the time when the Word of God is being made available to the people in written form. With this in mind, I would like to make two observations about the Word of God in Psalm 119 and will conclude my talk with those. Point number one. One cannot help but notice the complete absence of the use of the auditory channel for the receiving of the Word of God 
when you read through Psalm 119. Previously, the primary channel through which you were receiving the word of God was through your ears. Not so in Psalm 119. The psalm makes a total of 177 states, statements about God's word, and the word is never received through auditory channel. Instead, references are given where God's word is engaged through the sight of the psalmist. For instance, verse 18 says, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your Torah. Verse 130, the unfolding or unrolling, rather, of your word gives light. Verse 82, my eyes long for your saying. Not my ears longing for your saying but my eyes longing for your saying. Given the dating of the psalm embraced in the present study, it would seem that in the experience of the psalmist, the encounter with the word of God was happening in written form. Once the word has been accessed through sight, the auditory channel would then uh, a bit triggered as, for instance, when the psalmist declares the word or when he meditates on it. And by the way, when the Hebrew says meditate, it doesn't mean you are doing it in your mind. You are actually saying it out. Then your ears would be hearing it. So by that point, the psalmist's engagement with the word of God would be through all the parts of the body as mentioned in the psalm, his eyes, mouth, tongue, lips, heart, soul, hands, and feet. Point number two. The psalmist states that the word of God is righteous and true. It is the ground on which to know and ask for God's salvation. The psalmist not only knows the word well, but keeps and loves them. And the word gives him an understanding that not only surpasses that of those around him, but also about himself. And especially himself as demonstra is demonstrated when he is capable of clearly pointing out to God what his needs are spiritually. The word, not only the knowledge of it, but also the love of it is clearly in him. Yet, what all this knowledge of the word of God is ultimately doing for him is surprising to us. The last segment of the verb, uh, 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 of the psalm we hear, I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is delight. Let my soul live and praise you, and let your rules help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. This is really surprising, because if, if you follow the psalmist through the, the text, what you would have the confidence about is how much the psalmist not only knows the word, but follows it, lives it out, embraces it, and even asks for more understanding and teaching from the Lord 
He is in communion with God. He is an excellent Israelite. Well, what is the conundrum here? Wenham concludes that this is a confession due when you truly, truly get the Old Testament. The psalmist, start quote, the psalmist confesses the wonder and grace of God's self-revelation in the divine promises and demands, and also his need of that grace, without which he cannot live up to those demands. This note of urgent necessity that ends the psalm puts its author much closer to the publican in the gospel parable than to the Pharisee. Instead of affirming his own righteousness, the psalmist solicits the help of God, and reaffirms his constant desire for conversion. In other words, end quote, such an awakening has come through the word of God. The word is clear in what he taught the psalmist, and the psalmist sought it. And when he really sought it and got it, the conclusion was obvious. I needed the forgiveness from God. As a good Israelite, I need to be forgiven by God. And it is the word that taught it to him. And the way he learned about it was possible because the word was available to him in written format. Thank you.